Welcome all of you tonight in the name of Christ as we commence to look at the Word of God. Welcome those who are with us in live stream also. Tonight I'm beginning a series of messages on the New Covenant. I've, I felt compelled to do this. I'm, I think there can be a better understanding of it. It's to consist of uh, 40 or so messages, which will try and cover the subject as thoroughly as possible. Tonight we're going to deal as, with the scriptural concept of a covenant. <clears throat> now the word covenant is mentioned 292 times in scripture, and the word testament, which is an alternative word, mentioned four time, 14 times, all from Matthew through Revelation. First, I'll give an academic definition of covenant, what it is. Then a doctrinal definition of it. From the English point of view, a covenant is usually a formal, solemn, and binding written agreement or promise, usually under the seal of two or more parties, especially for the performance of some action. It's a, gr it's a ground or basis for something else that's being done. From the Hebrew point of view, a covenant is a, an alliance or a pledge or an agreement In the divine ordinance, it's sometimes attended by various signs and situations. The Greek use of the word means it's a disposition or arrangement of any sort <clears throat> in which one wishes to be valid. The, the last, and include that in that idea, is that it is the last disposition of which one makes of his earthly possessions. A covenant. So that's that's the academic definition of it. <clears throat> so it's in agreement. Yeah. <clears throat> now, from another standpoint, particularly from God, it's a pledge, commitment to do something. From another, it, it forms a basis upon which there's an inter, inter involvement of the parties. Person making the covenant, the people to whom the with whom the covenant is made, there will be no association of these parties apart from that covenant. That's the basis of any kind of involvement. In our case, with God, God doesn't work with people independent of a covenant. He doesn't work with people on the basis of what they desire and what they want and what they wish they had and all this sort of thing. This is not even how God works. Yeah. He has shown us in Scripture how He works. We want to establish that tonight, the definition of a covenant. <clears throat> if you give a doctrinal definition of the covenant of a covenant, <clears throat> there's a requirement for the death of the testator, the one that made the covenant, this is stated in Hebrews 9, 16, and 17, where a covenant, where a testament is, mm -hmm. there must also of necessity mm -hmm. be the death of the testator. Yeah, yeah. That's the one that made the covenant. Yeah. For the testament is of no is a force after men are dead. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Mm -hmm. So there could the benefits of the new covenant mm -hmm. couldn't be realized till Jesus died. Amen. David couldn't have the benefits of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Moses couldn't either. Abel couldn't either. The prophets couldn't either. Mm -hmm. They could not. Some of them were closer in their mindset to new covenant, but they could not have yeah. the benefits of the new covenant until Jesus died. Right. That's important to see that because some people don't have a very good understanding of mm -hmm. people that lived prior to Christ. Yeah. They were not forgiven. Mm -hmm. 
in the ultimate sense of the word. They were not justified in the ultimate sense of the word. Not like they are in Christ. There must be for this covenant, the death of the testator is absolutely necessary. Under the old covenant, the death was of an animal. It had to be, death means it's something that's alive. That life of that person or victim had to be forfeited in order for the covenant or agreement or pledge or promise to be enacted. Yeah. There had to be a death. Amen. So under this, I say under the old covenant, it was, a, it was of animal blood. Mm-hmm. Moses, Exodus 24, 8, took the blood, yeah. sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which yeah. the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Mm-hmm. In other texts, he sprinkled the, the book as well as the people. Uh-huh. Now, in Christ Jesus, it's not, of course, it's not uh, animal blood, but it is blood. Yeah. Yeah. Has to be shed. To clarify, the blood of Christ, any blood that Jesus shed prior to the cross is not the blood we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The blood he received when he is smitten in Caiaphas' chamber, Uh that's not the blood we're talking about. Uh The blood when he crowned with thorns put on his, that's not the blood we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Blood when he was flogged by Pilate, that's, that's, that's not the blood we're talking about. In fact, it's not the blood from came from any of his man-inflicted wounds. Yeah, yeah. It's the blood that came from his side. Uh-huh. Blood and water. Because that confirmed he was dead. Mm-hmm. But you got blood and water, the person has died. That's, yeah. that's why John said he came by water and by blood. See, that's what yeah. he's talking about. Some people read that and say, well, water, he came by baptism, blood, he came by death. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the blood that justifies is the blood that confirmed he was dead. Mm -hmm. It's not the blood shed while he was dying. Yes. Amen. It's the blood that resulted in his death. The death of the testator. Not the suffering of the testator. The death of the testator. It's important to see this because there are these days... Because of the ignorance of the people, there's all kind of spiritual nuts that are preaching. And some of them on the TV media, these are the people that get the money. These are the people that professing Christians send their money to. That teach that there's seven areas that Christ's blood was shed and that all that blood, Gethsemane, that blood, that's not the blood that justifies. That's right. You got to see this now. The, the testator's got to be dead. So when Jesus sweat drops, as it were, a great drop of blood. That's not the blood that justifies. It is not. Emphatically, it is not. So under under the new covenant, the blood is that of Christ on the cross. It's called the blood of His cross. That's the blood we're Amen. we're talking about. Hebrews 10.29 says, of how much sorer punishment, first, those that broke the law, they got punishment without mercy. Mm-hmm. That's how it worked. Yeah. It says, of how much sorer, that means a lot worse. It's a lot worse. Mm-hmm. How much sorer punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot mm-hmm. the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant yeah wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy thing. Don't imagine in your mind that God's going to forget something like that. He is not. Whoever tramples on Christ and despises his blood has a very gloomy future. And somehow this has got to get across to people. They've done despite to the spirit of grace. So this is a very sensitive area with, uh, with God. 
any infraction of the covenant is taken seriously. Now I want to deal here at this point with two different kinds of covenants that's in the Bible. <clears throat> One is a bilateral covenant. <clears throat> two sides to the there's two sides to the covenant. God's side, man's side. It's a bilateral covenant. The other kind of it's a unilateral covenant, one sided. It's a one sided covenant. So now the covenant is is a promise. Yeah, that's right. It's a commitment by God. Now I want to take a look at these. Bilateral covenant has two, two sides. This is the kind of covenant the first covenant or old covenant was. Exodus 15, 26. Now you want to pick up on this kind of language. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandment and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. But I'm not going to do this unless you do everything to which you've agreed in this covenant. There are no mistakes permitted. Mm -hmm. No deviate. This is a bilateral covenant. That's right. Yeah. No deviations. Mm -hmm. Not even one permitted. Not measuring up. It's not permitted. That's the bilateral covenant. Again, he said Exodus 19:8 or Exodus 15:26. Thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and do what is right in his sight. Now here's now here's the covenant. Exodus 19:8. Here's the covenant. And all the people they heard they heard the law spelled out. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That was the covenant. Genesis through Malachi is not the Old Testament. That's right. yep. mm -hmm. The law itself is not the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The Testament or the covenant was the agreement of the people. We concur. That's right, amen. You said thou shalt not, thou shalt not. We concur. We'll do everything you said. That was the covenant. Bilateral covenant. Any infraction, even one, means the covenant's broken. It's invalid as a basis for blessing. Just all it takes is, all it takes is start worshiping a calf, and that's that's it. Or is there anything going to pass to the people in fulfillment of the old covenant? In fact, he'll be against the people for the most part. He'll have to use an angel to lead them. Because if he leads them, they won't last. See? Now, to see this now, God, the old cover is not a system like you try to do your best. It's like this. You had to do your best all the time with no deviation. You could never forget anything about that covenant, and it was a lot of stuff in it. Bilateral covenant. Well, let's look at some more uh, more examples. We'll look at this a little further. More examples of bilateral covenant, two-sided covenants. Now, uh, here's one: is Abraham and the covenant of circumcision. That was a two two-sided covenant. Genesis seventeen ten. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. Ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be for a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in a house or brought by money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. It's a bilateral covenant. 
Anyone that's uncircumcised, they're out. That's right. That way it is. So if you were a Gentile and you wanted to adopt the, you had to be circumcised. That's right. That was a, it's a bilateral, two-sided covenant. He that's born in your house, that is bought with your money, so a, a servant, he has to be circumcised. There's my covenant, and my covenant shall be in your flesh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm? Yeah. My covenant, that only, only if this, if the man child is circumcised, mm -hmm. only under those conditions do you have any kind of identity with this covenant. If your man children aren't, you'll just be treated like Gentiles. You're not a people. It's a two-sided, two-sided covenant. And then there's the first covenant of the old covenant. It was a two-sided covenant. Exodus 19:5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice, indeed, indeed, keep my covenant, then you then. Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. I mean, I got a right to choose whatever people I want. Mm -hmm. Well, that's God said. All the earth is mine. I got a right to choose whoever I want. If I don't want to choose you, I got a right not to choose you. Yeah. That's right. And if I want to choose you, I got a right to choose you. All souls are mine. I'm. Yeah. These some people don't know this. Yeah. They think everybody has a have to have a fair shake. Yeah. Ye shall, if you do this, if you keep all the word, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. I'll work through you. But, yeah. see, but you have to obey my voice. Indeed, it just can't be, I'll do it. You've got to do it. Yeah. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation, these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Tell, tell the people this. We're going to be right up front about this, Moses. We're not going to be ambiguous about the agreement that's being struck here. Leviticus 18.4, Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. I have a right to tell you what to do. Hmm? All kind of church people don't know this. God has a right to tell you what to do. He has a right to tell you when to get up, when to go down, when to eat, what to read. He's got the, that's God. We're talking about God here. God do all my uh, judgments and obey them. If you do all my judgments, keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I'm the Lord. I have, I have a right to make the rules. Uh -huh. yes. These are the rules. I'm going to tell you what I what has to be done. You got to do it, all of it, without any deviation. If you do, I'll work with you. Yeah. That's the agreement. So we're talking about a bilateral mm -hmm. covenant. Leviticus 26. If ye shall despise my statutes. Or if your soul abhor my judgments. Boy, I wish he wouldn't have said that. I don't like that. This is what happens. So that ye will not do all my commandments, but ye shall break my covenant. I will also do this unto you. I will appoint over you terror, consumption, the burning egg, I will consume the eyes and the cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you. Ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee with an none pursueth. Right up front. Amen. It's a two-sided covenant. Mm -hmm. And the people got to agree to this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he didn't hide anything from them. So if you want to serve God by law, is that what you want? Is that what you want? Mm -hmm. This is what you got to do. Amen. I mean, this is going to make grace sound awful good. Yes, amen. Think about God 
the God that's making the covenant setting his face against the people that he yeah. made the covenant with. Yeah. Now, the scriptures tell us that the Ten Commandments were the words of the covenant. They weren't the covenant. Yeah. They were the words. That's right. Here's where it says in Exodus 34, 28. He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did eat, neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables of stone the, the covenant, the, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. These were the words. Now, this is what the people had to agree to. Uh -huh. yeah. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Thou, you got to agree now. This, mm -hmm. Just ten of them. I mean, he just gave Adam and Eve one. That's right, yeah. now, now we got ten. Mm -hmm. Now we got ten. It couldn't keep one, one time. That's right. Hmm? Mm -hmm. They couldn't keep one commandment one time. Right. But these people, they didn't think about this at the foot of Mount Sinai. They, mm -hmm. It sounded good. We can do it. We, we can do it. Let's talk this over. We, we can do it. I mean, there's only 10 of them. They're, they all look, they're pretty doable. Mm -hmm. They've overlooked like all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. They didn't, they didn't, pick, up, mm -hmm. they didn't pick up on that. But this is a two-sided covenant now. Mm -hmm. It's a bilateral. Now let's look at a, at a unilateral covenant, one-sided. Mm -hmm. Galatians 3.20 says, now the, a mediator is not the mediator of one. You don't need a mediator if there's only one party. But God is one. So so this is like it's another kind of circumstance here. This is not like an ordinary covenant. You gotta have two. With an ordinary covenant, you gotta have two. One makes the stipulation and the other keeps it. But now God's one. So it's gotta all be on God's side. Hebrews 9.15, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, this is as compared to keeping the words of the, mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So now the basis for keeping this covenant is completely different than a bilateral covenant. Yeah. A bilateral covenant says, this is my side, that's your side. If, if, you, if you keep, you know I'm going to keep my side, I'm God. But if you keep your side, that now we got something. If you don't keep your side, we got nothing. But this isn't the kind of covenant the new covenant it is. This is not a map to heaven. It's not a rule book. Right. Oh, there's rules in it and commandments, how well I know, but that's not the basis. The basis, uh -huh. the foundation of your association with God is not what you do. Amen. It's what God does. And you know whether God's doing it or not as to whether you have a heart for, for this sort of thing. Now, let's give some other examples of unilateral covenants. Covenants that were one-sided. They didn't have conditions attached to them. Let's look, first of all, at, at Noah, the, the covenant made with Noah. It was a unilateral covenant. Whether or not God sent a flood didn't depend on anything Noah did. See? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a unilateral covenant. Mm -hmm. Genesis 9-9 Behold, I established my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Mm -hmm. wasn't established by an agreement. See, under the law, was a, they had to agree. This, uh -huh. this is not. I established with my covenant with you and your seed after you, with every living creature that's with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out from the ark to every beast on the earth, I will establish my covenant mm -hmm. with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. That's a covenant he made. Yeah. That didn't depend on anything. It didn't even depend on Noah building the ark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sin. This is my covenant to you now. Uh -huh. I'm not going to sin. 
another flood. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there be any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Yeah, that'd be pretty hard to accept, so God says. This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that's with you for perpetual generations. You're not going to like renew this every so many years. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Yeah. It wasn't for men to see. Yeah, amen. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my, I will, re I will remember right. my covenant that's between me and you and every living creature of all flesh on the waters shall no more become a flood to the earth mm -hmm. and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that's upon the earth. Mm. A unilateral yeah. covenant. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. Unilateral. Mm -hmm. Now there's a, another unilateral, one side that was a one sided covenant. Here's another one-sided covenant. It's God's promise to Abraham. Genesis 17, 4 through 7. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Now, that wasn't conditioned upon any something that Abraham did. God said, this is what I'm going to do. It's a unilateral covenant. Mm -hmm. And you will find the more wide-sweeping a covenant is, the more it tends to be one-sided. Mm -hmm. The more provincial a covenant is, it tends to be two-sided. So that's, a, that's an example of a unilateral covenant. Now, as you look at the covenant, you can look at it a couple of different ways. One is that Jesus himself is the covenant. Yeah, yeah. And the prophets said this. In Isaiah 42, 6, this is the one where Jesus, the coming Savior, is referred to as my servant. He said, I am, I the Lord have called thee in my right, and that's just talking to his servant. I the Lord have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, I will keep thee and give thee. I will give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Nobody's going to know about this covenant unless they know about my son. <laughs> it's going to be wrapped up in my service. It's going to do all my pleasure. He's going to do all my pleasure. Everything's going to depend on him. Isaiah 49, 8 says kind of the same thing. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, in the day of salvation have I helped thee. I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit desolate heritages. So if, Je if Jesus hadn't have died, the earth couldn't have lasted. It would have very quickly been removed. So here you hear now it's a unilateral covenant. Mm -hmm. He gives a he gives a person mm -hmm. the the Messiah. He gives him as a pledge of the covenant. So you know no more of the new covenant than you know of Jesus. Uh -huh, yeah. So are you PT people that are fundamentally unacquainted with the new covenant? Uh -huh. They are fundamentally unacquainted with Christ. Yeah, now, they may not agree to this, but that doesn't make any difference whether they do or not. He, the covenant, the more clear Christ is to you, the more clear the covenant becomes. I'm going to give him to you for a covenant. Now, here's a, that, that's view number one of, a, of this new covenant. Now, here's another view of the new covenant that shows it's unilateral. The covenant technically was made with Jesus. Not, not merely with the people. 
Galatians 3.16, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. The promises, if you know this text, is talking about the covenant, new covenant. He saith not unto seeds, the promises were given to Abraham and his and, and his seed. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, <laughs> which is Christ. So yeah. he, so the covenant actually was made with Christ, so, yeah. it, so that it worked this way. Son, if you do mm -hmm. everything that I've assigned you to do, yes. that will ratify the covenant. Yes. Now that's a whole lot better than the old Amen. than the old covenant. I, 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 I trust I haven't like oversimplified this, but it's very important. It's very important to see this because that's how this table looks completely different in the view of this. Because we're look, we're remembering Christ at the point that the blood of the covenant was shed. So the clearer. Christ becomes to you, the clearer the covenant becomes to you, and the more sure it becomes to you. Yes. Now you begin to realize, listen, anything based on Christ can't not be flimsy or Amen. unsure or wishy-washy or sporadic or seasonal. or It can't be anything based on Christ. Amen. Well, that's a piece of good news to me. Now in this covenant, under the bilateral covenant, what men did, their works, that was what solidified the covenant. If you do everything I say, that's what under Christ is faith that solidifies the covenant. See, he that believes, that's what makes the covenant firm, experientially speaking. Now let's look for a, a few moments at the the purpose of the covenant. <clears throat> the covenant provides a framework mm -hmm. in which the Lord works. For instance, in the covenant of circumcision that was given to Abraham, mm -hmm. that was a framework in which God worked. Right. You're going to work with somebody, first of all, check to see, so I speak as a man, to see if they're circumcised. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. going to determine whether we can get on with anything or not. Uh -huh. That's why when Israel entered into the promised land, they hadn't performed this circumcision while they were wandering. So remember, they had to perform this. They circumcised all the men child. They circumcised them at the, because to, before we can get any further now with God, he's going to operate within the framework of this covenant, yeah, right. which to them was the covenant of circumcision. Now, in the new covenant, he's going to operate within the framework of the covenant itself. Now, Hebrews 8, 10 through 12 spells out the covenant. He, he tells you what it is, the words of the covenant. Like the Ten Commandments were the words of the first covenant. These are the words of the new covenant. And he says, I'll put my laws into their mind. I'll write my laws on their hearts. Yeah. I will be their God. That is of, of choice. Mm -hmm. They shall be my people mm -hmm. of choice. They will all know me from the least to the greatest. I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness mm -hmm. and their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. All right, that's the framework he's going to work with them. Mm -hmm. If you want God to work in your life, it has to be in that framework. This has to be there. You can't be thinking different than God and expect to enjoy the benefits of the new covenant. It's just an imagination. You can't. You, you can't. If you want the benefits of the new covenant, you cannot be kowtowing to somebody beside God. You can't be compromising with somebody beside God. You can't let somebody else direct your life. He's going to work within the parameters of this covenant. Amen. If you want God to work with you, you've got to be, you've got to, you've got to know you're his people. Yes. Yeah. You belong to him. That's got to be a conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. I am the Lord's. The Lord is mine. 
How can I sin and do this? How can I do this and sin against God? So you've got to. This is the framework. He work. He works in this framework. It's like this. Here comes up. Up shoots a prayer request. I'm speaking as a man now. So the Lord says, "Let's see. I'm going to first check and see if my laws are in His mind." How does this person think? That's right. Is he competing with me? Or does he believe in me? How's his heart? How are his desires? Are his desires in sync with mine? Or is he at variance? He, this is, he works within the framework of the covenant. That's right. Who's he really serving? Is that person, is he calling out to me because there isn't anybody else he can think of? And does he know me? Is this person, this, this prayer is coming up here. Does this person know me? Is he acquainted with me? Or am I a strange person to him? Does he, maybe he doesn't know my ways. Well, if he doesn't, he's got, we've got to work on that first. He's got, see, this needs the framework. See, once you see this, it changes the way you think about life and about living because the frame, the covenant is the framework within which he works. Amen. We are faced with a church that violates every single aspect of this covenant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And to think that God's going to work in that hodgepodge is just an imagination. It's not going to happen. Some of us have found out after years, you know, we found out well, nothing's changing here. Why not? Because it, God couldn't work within the covenant. He, he couldn't center his work in Christ mm -hmm. who wasn't even known by the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They weren't serving Christ. They weren't suffering for Christ. Mm -hmm. They weren't a light for Christ. Christ was at working through them. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't work. This is where he works. He works within this covenant this way. And all of that uh, is based on Christ's death. All this writing of the law and the mind and what that, what that means, right? He writes the law in the mind doesn't mean that all of a sudden you've got a perfect recall of Romans, you know. That's right. not what he means. Mm -hmm. He means that you have a, an, agree, an inner agreement mm -hmm. yeah. so that you may hear God's laws for the first time. You never heard this particular utterance of God, but it, it, you see it. You agree with it right away. Why? That's because it was written in your heart. Amen. He, he gave you a unanimity with his law. See, when a person is born again, whether they know it, and they, very few people know this, I think at the first, I didn't, I know. They're in a fundamental agreement with God. All you got to do is tell them what God said, and they'll do it. Yeah. They'll, they'll do it. If he says, well, you got to repent and be baptized, they just up and do it. That's right, yeah. And don't for it, no. No further word needs to be said. If they hear God says, be holy as I am holy, that, that, that's enough for me. I'm going to work on it. That's a sign the law is written on your heart and in your mind. Yeah, when you, there's a conflict, someone asks you to do something, you know is, or at least you're suspicious, it's not proper, and you have doubts about it. If you're a new covenant person, you'll say, well, this, I don't think this is something God had asked me to do. Huh? It's written, he's working within the confines of this covenant. But if a person doesn't think that way, there's a sense in which they're on their own. They'll all know me. Now, this is like a very strange thing in our society, church society. People don't, they can't pick up on whether God did the thing or the devil did the thing. They, they can't <laughs> decipher between the, between the two. So some of them, well, the Lord didn't send that storm. There's some people's storms in the Bible that uh, people say, hey, wait a, wait a minute. Uh, these heathen sailors in Jonah's boat say, hey, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. We got a little testimony to give you here. That there are storms he does send. Yes, yes. In fact, he says there can't be one unless I do send it. Amen. This is God's world. That's right. 
Your circumstances are ordered by God. You've got to be able to see God in whatever happens to you. If it's someone comes against you or it's some inadequacy or it's some great benefit, you've got to be able to see God in the thing. Amen. It is the Lord. <laughs> Let him do what seemeth him good. John heard this voice. The other disciples just heard a fellow on the shore saying, Have you caught anything out there? <laughs> he said, No, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. Hey, you're fishing on the wrong side of the boat. <laughs> Cast your net on the other side. John said, It's the Lord. Yeah, See, he knew the Lord. He knew the Lord. He recognized him. Amen. When the Lord Jesus talked to Paul about staying in Corinth, uh -huh. Jesus didn't say, Who's that? Who's that talking to me? See, he knew. He knew sometimes your heart will talk to you. And if you're in the New Covenant, you know, you know that's the Lord. I, I know that's the Lord working there with me. He said, that you need to stop doing that. You've experienced this. Surely you've experienced it. You, this isn't right. They'll all know me from the least to the greatest. Oh, the least won't know as much as the... As the greatest, but they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. Well, I've given you kind of a bird's eye view. That's what a covenant, that's the kind of covenant now we're talking about in this, in this series of messages. And it's all going to fit in that God draws up the guidelines or parameters within which he's going to, he's going to work. To Israel, he said, uh, here's... Here's the agreement. I'm going to, I'll give you 10 mm -hmm. commandments, but you've got to keep all 10 of them all the time without fail. If you do, I'll take care of the rest. If you don't, and they said, all that you said, we will do. Uh -huh. Moses took the word back to God. God said, oh, that they had a heart. <laughs> what they said sounds good, but oh, they don't see. They don't see that what I've told them to do, they're going to have to have me to do it. That's what happens in the New Covenant, brother. <laughs> brother Michael's going to have our exhortation tonight.